So, um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers um, for inviting me and the opportunity to give a talk. Um, my talk is about uh, periodic interpolation of Eisenstein, uh, motivic Eisenstein classes. So this is so a talk about special K-theory classes, and I think it's fair to say that nowadays special K-theory classes have really a very stressful life because there are many conjectures around, so there are many, many properties they have to satisfy, and they have really a multitasking to do. And it's amazing how many properties they, they really should have in terms of congruences and so on. And in my talk, I, I want to present a general result, which, which comes from a joint work with Annette Huber, where we constructed special K-theory classes, um, which are related to Eisenstein series, and um, uh, which also satisfy a periodic interpolation property. And in believing all these conjectures, which they are around about special values of L functions and these K-theory classes, you can, in the end, really prove a, a strong theorem about them. So um, let me start with the introduction. So um, the setup is as follows. So we have a smooth commutative group scheme. over a base S, which should be Noetherian and finite dimensional to apply the theory of motivic sheaves. And the relative dimension should be, should be D, say. And then we consider the first relative homology in this situation. We denote this by HQ. And this is somehow a motivic sheaf. So this is p lower shriek of q twisted d times. And you sh should think of this as the first homology um, uh, motivic, as a motivic sheaf of the situation g over s. <clears throat> OK, and then resulting from work with Annette Huber, uh, Um, we can construct certain motivic cohomology classes associated to non-zero torsion sections of G of G. And torsion section. And um, then there exist classes which in many cases are known to be non-zero, but they have many more properties, which sit in the 2D minus 1 cohomology of the base motivic with values in the case symmetric power of this first homology twisted by D. Yeah. So um, there are many concrete examples you could think about here. These are called motivic Eisenstein classes for a reason which will become apparent in a minute. And um, these generalize earlier constructions of, of Balenson and Balenson de Linie in the case of elliptic curves and, and the multiplicative group. So for example, if, if G over S is an elliptic curve, and S is maybe the modelized space of elliptic curves with some level structure, then these classes can be really, at least their realizations in Betty cohomology or the linear cohomology can be explicitly described in terms of Eisenstein series. And um, to have some notation about this, so the K-theory classes, they have their realizations in all kinds of cohomology theory. And we consider the regulator maps or the higher churn class maps from this motivic cohomology to any other motivic cohomology, uh, any other cohomology theory, 
Um, and then you have the appropriate coefficients here. And you should think of, for example, question mark can be the usual singular cohomology or Betty cohomology, the delinear Bales and cohomology, um, et al cohomology, uh, syntomic cohomology, or algebraic Duran cohomology, and certainly more. Okay, and we we write. We have a shorthand, so the, the image of this motivic classes we denote by oops, eyes um, question mark T. And we have this K, so this is the K symmetric power of this, this first homology. Okay. So there are some things known about these classes. Um, so quite generally, so the, the um, Betty realization of this class, this is a class in singular cohomology. This can be described, for example, in favorable cases where S is the modelized space. This is then class in group cohomology, for example. And this can be described in terms of Eisenstein series. Yeah. Uh, in terms of Eisenstein series. And this is the reason for the name, these classes. Yeah. So this is the result um, yeah, in this for for G abelian scheme, I should say. It, not calculated in quite this generality at the moment. Um, so this is maybe a result of Balenson together with myself and Andre Levin. Well, this is a preprint from 2014. Um, so in the case where G is an elliptic curve, much more is known, and, and this is classical. So, um, and there this was known before by Bailenson. So, for example, um, this in the delinear cohomology is given by real analytic Eisenstein series. Analytic Eisenstein series. So, this is old result of Bailenson um, from the 80s, and um, then you know also the syntomic realization in syntomic cohomology, and this is given by periodic Eisenstein series. And this is a result by Kenichi Banai and myself. So, all these realizations can be somehow described in terms of Eisenstein series. We don't know this yet in this, this uh, generality. Computations are, are difficult. Um, and it's very classical that these classes in the elliptic case, they have been applied to prove theorems about special values of L functions, for example, for Hecke characters, for modular forms, also in the work of Cato on Cato's Euler system these classes appear, and so on. So they are very important in arithmetic. And um, the point is that we can add here also something. We know also something about the etal cohomology of these classes. And they can be given by um, what I call the Soule twists of modular units. And this implies already some kind of interpolation property of these classes. And the first result I want to talk about, I don't know if this works, only for very tall people. Let's see if I fall in this category. Um, so um, I want to talk about the periodic interpolation
I'm not falling quite in this category, it seems. Uh, periodic interpolation of these classes. And the point is here, um, I want to consider the etar realization, but I consider this now in a very strange way, namely, I vary the k. You see, this is, this is in a, in a, at first sight, this is a completely strange question, because you have here these different coefficient systems depending on k, so this is a k-symmetric power, and it's not clear at all if these classes somehow can be related in, in any good way. But the theorem tells you that this is the case, but to explain this, I have to recall a little bit something about Ivazava algebras. So let H be just the free ZP module of rank N, then in Ivazava theory, one considers the Ivazava algebra. So Ivazava algebra uh, of ZP valued measures on, on ZP uh, on H. And it is known that this is isomorphic to a power series ring in n variables with convolution of measures as, as the multiplication. And um, the, this Iwasawa algebra can also be described as the inverse limit of finite dimensional things. So you take the group ring of <coughs> this finite group um, uh, finite group of finite z modulo p to the r z module of rank n. You take the <coughs> group ring with finite coefficients and the inverse limit. Mm -hmm. And the group ring multiplication also gives you here the structure of the Vazava algebra. Yeah. And then it's very important for us for the interpolation that whenever you have um, ZP valued measures, or I mean measures, then you can talk about the moments. And so we have here a moment map. And this goes, if you want to handle the, the integrality properties correctly, you don't take the symmetric powers, but you take the tensor symmetric powers. So this is really the, the invariant tensors uh, uh, of degree k of h. And, um, and this is a moment map. Moment map. And, um, this is induced by the obvious pairing. So I have measures on H, and then I take polynomial functions on H. So these are elements in SIMK H dual. And if I integrate them, then I get, because these measures are ZP valued, I get an element in ZP. So here I have a measure, and here I have a polynomial. And then I map this to the integral of um, p with respect to mu. Yeah? If you dualize this to the other side, then observing that the dual of this is a tensor symmetric power, you get the moment map. This is this is a, this is a symmetric. This is a, the um, symmetric tensors. So these are the invariants under the symmetric group in the in H. So this is H tensor K, and then you take the invariants under the symmetric group. Is that the case divided power? This is divided power. Yeah, this is divided power is much better because then you you don't use it just for for 
Um, so for free modules, this is the same as the divided powers, but the right thing would be to use divided powers, yeah, because somehow the divided power algebra is is the real the good dual of of sub k. I didn't want to assume this that everybody knows this, but of course everybody should know about the divided power ring. And um, okay, now we apply this. We want to apply this in this situation and to the, the first homology. And here is a, ah. There's no obstruction to do this in the German way here, right? I mean this, I don't know. Oops. Okay, so now this construction, yeah, can be sheafified, sheafified, um, for to take for the first homology in etal homology of that p with the D, which is HZP, or leave this out. So this is this is now the integral first homology. This is um, this is fiber-wise, this is locally free, that P module in this situation, but the, the dimension can change in each stock because we have a, a an arbitrary group scheme. So, for example, it could be a degenerating <coughs> elliptic curve. So we have the Tate module in each fiber, but in the degenerating fiber, we have the Tate model of GM. Yeah? This is a typical situation to, to keep in mind. And this can be sheafified for this, and, and you get somehow a sheaf of Ivasava algebras and a moment map as before. <coughs> Um, to this. Okay, so fiber-wise, this is somehow the Tate module. Yeah. Okay, and now we have the following theorem, which might look very innocent at, at first glance, but we, as I said, we will see later an application where this is used in a very essential way, these kind of theorems. So we have some torsion section and to be uh, definite, uh, to, to, to fix here the, the uh, the torsion, this is necessary in the theorem because it's now an integrality result. We take an n-torsion section, yeah? N-torsion section. And then there exists what I call an Eisenstein-Ivasawa class. Um, Eisenstein Evalava. And this is now in the Tau cohomology um, of the base with values in the Evalava algebra, just the D, with the property that if I consider the following composition of maps, <coughs> So I first 
use this moment map and then I get something here, the tensor symmetric power and then um, I have, uh, if I take here tensor this with Q coefficients then the tensor symmetric power and the usual symmetric power coincide. So I have a map here to H2D minus 1 et al of S in the symmetric powers and now I take somehow the QP Tate module twisted P times. Yeah? And the point is that this Iwasawa Eisenstein class this interpolates all these different Eisenstein classes up to a very explicit factor. Yeah, even though they, they live in completely different um, K groups or motivic cohomology groups, they, they can be interpolated in this way. So this is in a certain sense an, a strong integrality statement for these classes. And this is very important for arithmetic applications because Iwasawa theory then usually plays, plays a heavy role if you study special values of L functions. Sure. Yeah, this doesn't matter. Yeah, you twist twice. <laughs> this, this is the homology. I mean, um, the, the right thing to, to, to view this is somehow, this is the minus first of, of this, then no twist appears. But because pi is smooth, I can write it somehow in this way. Yeah? This, this is the point. Um, P, oh, P does not divide N. This is the only, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. This is this end. Characteristic, and of course, um, P and N should be uh, always invertible on, on S. Yeah. To have everything at all. Yeah, sorry, this, I, I forgot this. Um, yeah, so this is always et al. And, um, okay, so I want to uh, spend some minutes on, on the idea of the proof. Because this, I think this is an interesting, uh, um, yeah, maybe it's an interesting coincidence, which we, but this has deeper reason. Um, and to make everything simple, I, I only discuss G abelian scheme. Yeah. So, and the point is that um, I didn't tell you how these Eisenstein classes were constructed in the beginning. Yeah. I will not say much more because I will just open another black box and they come from this black box. Uh, don't, don't go into this black box because this is then would be a talk about this result uh, of Annette and myself. Um, this, this is not my focus today. So, um, the idea is as follows. So, there's a very standard Tanakian game, so unipotent uh, QP sheaves of uh, length K, say, on a over S, they are classified by, you evaluate at the zero section of this abelian scheme, and then they are classified by algebras, uh, by under modules, under the symmetric algebra modulo um, the kth plus first power of the augmentation ideal, I should say. I write it like this. So this is the standard augmentation of the symmetric algebra. And I take the k plus first power of this ideal and, and such modules are on 
on S. Yeah? And this goes simply like this. So if I have a sheaf here, I simply pull back along the zero section, and uh, then this is some standard Tanakian game for, for relative unipotent sheaves. Yeah. So, but this means in particular there is, here we have a distinguished object, namely the algebra itself. And this has some object here, and this is called the case logarithm sheaf. And this is really, you can think of this, for example, also on the, um, as somehow the cave power of the, the universal Kuma torsor on, on your abelian scheme. Yeah, this is something which is really intrinsically very important. So this, this universal module we have, or universal unipotent sheaf. And the point is that these Eisenstein classes, they are really specializations of of a polylogarithm on this group scheme. And this will be the main point in this interpolation theorem. Yeah, I mean, um, standard reference, uh, I mean, this, this goes under uh, different names in the literature, um, but I think um, yeah, the papers of Annette and myself are maybe a good reference for this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, this is uh, there, there is work by uh, Dick Hain, there, there is work by Bailenson, um, but this is usually in a different, a little bit different setting, yeah? So, so, um, and, okay, so, um, so this, this paper of Annette and myself, this is on the archive, so. Um, okay. Um, hmm, sorry? The linear should be mentioned here. That's that's certainly true. Uh, um, certainly, many other people which uh, I the uh, which which I forgot. So, so. Um, so there is following fact. So so if I pull back this. Um, so if I have a, a torsion point, then the logarithm sheaf, so this is this is an iterated extension of sheaves which are trivial in the sense that they are pull back of sheaves coming from the base. But if you if you pull back along a torsion section, um, then by functoriality essentially of these guys, you can see that these are uh, these split. So this is direct sum of symmetric powers. Okay. Hmm, sorry? The sum is already I. I oh sorry, that's true. There's this looks better. Yeah, the unipotent sheaf. So, so we say sheaf is trivial if it's on A, if it's just the pullback of a, of a list sheaf on S, say. Yeah, and, and iterated extensions of these are unipotent. Yeah? So, this is, this is the point. Okay. Um, so, uh, the point is, so, um, 
So the theorem which, which Annette and I really proved is that there exists a polylogarithm class. So let C be an integer bigger one. Then there exists class polylogarithm. Um, make this a little bit simpler here. Um, say this exists even motivically, but this is not so important now. This is the main point of our paper, but not for this talk. And you have, you have a class somehow which, which has values in these unipotent sheaves, <coughs> universal unipotent sheaves, and this lives on the group scheme. So in our case, in an abelian scheme, yeah, without the C torsion points. Yeah, so this is a whole family of, of, um, extension classes. Uh, this, you can see it like this. And the point is, so if you restrict at a torsion point, then you get a class in here. And this is in the direct sum i equals zero k, k symmetric power. Um, and the point is that the polylog gives you all these Eisenstein classes at once. So i is e, i equals zero up to k is a class in here. So, and now you see that somehow periodic interpolation of these different classes has to do with, with some uh, mm, interpolation of these logarithm sheets. And now one can understand how this theorem goes, namely one, one has the following theorem, which, which is essential, so this is not, not too difficult. So you can define also unipotent ZP sheets um, on A over S um, of length K. And the point is that these, this is not so hard to see, because etal sheaves of this kind, they are, uh, that P sheaves, they are essentially inverse limits of sheaves with finite coefficients. And it's no longer at the, at the board, but somehow sheaves with finite coefficients trivialize on a finite etal cover. Yeah, so um, you need only some of the, the finite etal group ring to trivialize this, and it should be not too surprising that this is the same as lambda h, this Iwasawa algebra, divided by the kth power of its augmentation ideal modules on S. Yeah. And if you have that, then you can, then you have the universal object here, which gives you an integral version of this logarithm sheaf, and then you pull this back along a torsion section, and you prove that this is essentially, again, the Iwasawa algebra, and this gives you this interpolation result. Yeah. This, this is the idea. Yeah. So it really has to do with, with classifying um, unipotent or, or etal sheets on, on this group scheme. This is the way you get at this interpolation results. But now you have the obvious question, why do you care about this? Yeah, so. Somewhere along the line, the capital A appears. A capital A. There, oh, this is right. A is G. Yeah, this is, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, so I, I said, uh, uh, G equals A, a billion scheme. I'm sorry. <laughs> so this, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is, this is like Cortinas and Cortinas. <laughs> so, the, the, but the identity should be there. Yeah. So <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Yes, sure. Yeah. 
I mean, so the point is that this Iwasawa algebra, this is the completion of the group rings, of, of these finite group rings, but it's also a completion of this with respect to the augmentation ideals. So if you take the inverse limit, you get just the Iwasawa algebra. Yeah, because this is, you can think of this as a power series ring, and then it's obvious. Yeah, yeah right. So, ah, I have, whoop, 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 no, okay. So now I want to talk about an application um, because you can say, okay, um, that's, yeah, this, this is a, a good example of this, this multitasking of this K-theory elements here. So they have to satisfy congruence properties. This is what is behind this interpolation result. But what, why should one care? And I want to give you one example why you should care, or why you could care. And this example concerns uh, modular firms. So this is just the case of elliptic curves, which was known before, but of course we hope for generalizations by using here group schemes, and at the moment um, uh, I'm investigating strongly the case of Hilbert uh, modular varieties and try to get also results like the following applications, but this is very, very difficult. So um, let's fix a prime number now, bigger than five for technical reasons. And now we're doing really some more arithmetic. So we take uh, F and G, these are cusp forms of weight, say, K plus two and K prime plus two. And we want K at least, um, so the whole story is empty if we take K equals K prime. So we take K bigger than K prime and we call MF and MG the associated Galois representations. Um, so QP Galois representations. And then we have the ranking convolution L series, which is given by AN times BN divided by N to the S. Um, if a n and b n are the Fourier coefficients of of the cusp forms, yeah, this is the Rankine convolution L series, and then we have the following theorem. So this is joint work with Leffler and Zerbes. So um, for almost all primes p greater than five as four, plus some technical conditions, too many p's for almost all p's. Um, this is the same p as this p and this p. Yeah, so it's all the same. But here it's, um, so we can, this should only say we can take almost all p's yeah, and um, we have some technical condition. Um, then for k prime plus one less equal j less equal than k, um, we have the following result. If the ranking convolution at one plus j is non-zero, then the bloch cato selma group of the tensor product Gawa representation with the appropriate twist, um, uh, one plus j is zero. So in a certain sense, this L function controls the behavior of of an etal cohomology group. 
So this is the bloch gato selma group. And to make this even more concrete, so sorry? No, no, this is the global. This is the global Galwa group. But you have the condition that, that at P um, you get crystalline classes. Yeah? Uh, you, you want to have crystalline classes. So So using an idea of Bertolini, Damont, and Rutger, one can prove the following result, corollary. So let E over Q be an elliptic curve. Um, rho, an irreducible art, uh, art in representation. And uh, with splitting field, F, which splits this row, then one has the following. So one can define the row twisted L function of E, yeah? This is also defined essentially as, as a convolution L function. So you take for F uh, the uh, cusp form, which belongs to E by the theorem of Wiles and, and many others. And, um, and for G, you take, uh, for example, a modular form of weight one, which belongs to this Artin representation by work of Deligny and Serre. And then if this is non-zero, then you get that the row part of the model veil group of E, yeah, so this is, this is with a grain of salt here, yeah, so, so the row part, you have to make sense out of this, but I state it like this because this is intuitive. And the P part of the Tate-Shafarevich group, and also the row part of this, these are finite. Yeah, so this is something like a, a very small part of an equivariant Birch and Swinnett and Dyer conjecture. Yeah? <coughs> yeah. So, I mean, this theorem and, and also the corollary doesn't mention Eisenstein classes or anything here. Yeah. So this is, uh, um, first of all, completely unclear how this should be related. Um, and I want to explain how, how these classes play an essential role in, in these theorems. Mm, but this is... So the, the general strategy for proving such results, this was certainly uh, devised by Cato and um, in his work on, on the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture for, for modular forms and uh, or elliptic curves. And um, uh, in principle, we follow this strategy, but you will see that, that uh, we use in a crucial way really motivic elements, K-theory elements, uh, at a point where our strategy is really completely different from Cato's yeah, in the so-called explicit reciprocity law. Okay, let me talk a little bit about the idea of proof. So, and now you have to, you have to be careful here. So here, here we have this condition. So the L values we are considering, the J has to, has to have this condition. But now we're doing something else. We prove, yeah? so the first step is proof 
a relation for um, the j which are between zero and k prime. Yeah. And uh, so between um, et al or Galois cohomology and periodic L functions. So this is somehow at the wrong. This is unfortunately, first of all, this is this is at the wrong L values. Yeah, and and um, so the general philosophy is always the K theory classes. Um, they belong only to certain so-called non-critical L values, but Bertrand and Dyer, for example, this has to this deals with critical L values. So first of all, there's no bridge between non-critical L values, which concern certain twists, yeah, certain J, namely K theory will, will deal with this J, and the J's you're interested in. But the periodic interpolation will provide this bridge, how to get from one value to the other. And this, this is the point. Yeah? And, but we will also see that it's extremely important to avoid really too many calculations that the classes are k-theoretical in nature. Yeah? Because the first step is as follows. So we now deal with the universal elliptic curve over the modelized space, um, the modular curve y1 of n. Round brackets are usually used. So um, this is the universal elliptic curve. And, um, and then I write a big diagram on the next blackboard. There will be some black boxes appear, but it's just for you to get an idea how these classes are used. And the point is as follows. So here we start with motivic cohomology of this y1 of n. Um, I should abbreviate this a little bit, otherwise the diagram will be too big. So let's just write y. Um, and here we take, with some numerology which is not so important, um, we take uh, the k plus k prime minus 2j symmetric power of hq. And here we have these Eisenstein classes, the motivic Eisenstein classes of this degree. They're sitting in here. So, and now we do the following. So, we, we want to get classes in here, um, h3. So, I do the following. I push these classes forward with respect to the diagonal map, diagonal map from y to y times y. Then I restrict this to being qp classes. So I restrict y to qp. So restriction qp, this is the map. This is some of the pullback from y qp, the special fiber into y. And um, then I also apply the etal regulator to it. And I end up in classes here, y times y. And here I can write the 
kth symmetric power of hq, exterior tensor product with the k prime symmetric power of hq, and the whole thing twisted by 2 minus j. And this I can now project to the I have restricted to QP, thank you. Everything should be over QP. Thanks. Yeah, and so, and then if I do this, I get really et al classes over um, QP um, with values in this Gawa representation and um, the twist is minus J. The reason for this is that, that somehow in the second etal cohomology over the algebraically closed field um, of with values in this, these Gal tensor product of these Galois representations sits as, as a direct summand, which can be cut out by Hecker operators. Yeah, and we project to this part. Yeah, and we have this here. And we do essentially the same process here. Um, restricting to QP, but we, we, um, also take, we take here the symptomic regulator, and then we land in, in something and the projection as well. And then we land in symptomic cohomology. Um, QP with values in MF tender MG twisted minus j. And the symptomic cohomology, this has a natural map to the d de Ram functor of Fontaine, mf tensor mg twist minus j, and then you divide out the zero filtration strap, so these are filtered modules. And between these two guys, you have the bloch Cato exponential map, which is an isomorphism. Bloch Cato exponential map. And this diagram commutes. And this is important. So, what does that mean? Um, the classes we get here, starting from this Motivic Eisenstein classes, we get certain classes here. And we compa can compare these classes with classes in symptomic cohomology. And what is important here is that one can calculate the class here in terms of periodic Eisenstein series. Yeah, so here we have I, Sun, um, I don't, I write, uh, can be calculated and in terms of periodic Eisenstein series and really very explicitly. So you can write down the Q expansion of these, these classes. And uh, what you get is that um, you get that the values here um, uh, get is that the, the symptomic Eisenstein class is directly related to the periodic L function of F G at 1 plus j, yeah, this is the periodic L function ranking convolution of HEDA. And this is why ev everything is explicit, so you can really do this calculation. But this means that the Galois cohomo or Etal cohomology classes, which you have here, they are controlled by the periodic L function. And now you want to use um, the second step is now um, use periodic interpolation everywhere. And now it gets, gets very technical because the cusp forms, you, you put the cusp forms in HEDA families and um, so you, you make a periodic L function for HEDA families even. This is also due to HEDA. And in the generality we need it, this is due to Eric Oban. 
And um, so you, you get a very big p L function and you get Hida families. Hida families are also something which interpolate in terms of the Iwasawa algebra. And so you interpolate all, all this part and the big p L function will be, will be in, a, in a very big vector space, an element. Um, uh, so maybe I... I have the time to write actually something. That's good. Uh, everywhere to get at um, a J with the property K prime plus one smaller like this. So um, so we replace this cusp forms by Hida families. And then we have also the big p L function of this Hida family. p L function for Hida families. And then you try it somehow to write down this diagram without the motivic part, only on the etal side. Um, uh, and try to interpolate this diagram on finite level in terms of Iwasawa theory. This looks roughly as follows. So you have, you take now your big Eisenstein class, um, Eisenstein Iwasawa class here, restricted to QP, and then you still have somehow you can push forward along the diagonal and you project to F comma G. And there are also big Gawa representations associated to F and G. So M, F, M, G. These are lambda Z, P, so the classical Iwasawa algebra uh, representations associated to F and G. And you get then really elements here. Now I have to take the completed tensor product because these are all lambda modules. You get even three variable if you do this correctly, but this is technical. Minus J. And the point is there's a big map L, which is the pattern of the U logarithm. To a big D Duran module associated to the Skawa representations. So everything can can be done on this infinite level, yeah. Um, modulus some fill zero, and the point is that that now um, we can specialize here with the moment maps, moment maps um, to k plus k prime minus two j to the etal classes we had before. And um, and here the same is possible. You can specialize to D Duran MF tensor MG um, minus J modulo fill zero. And here we have the map from above. Which is this map, star star. Ah. 
And here, this diagram commutes if I put star star here. So, and now you see if you want to prove something which you can specialize at the J where we are interested in, we want to prove something here on this, this interpolation level. And we want to prove an identity between this Eisenstein Evazawa class and the periodic L function, which sits, which is an element here. Yeah, this is an element, can be seen as an element in this big D Ram space. And to see if this class really maps to this, we can check this on finite level. But we don't check this at the finite level where, where we are uh, finally interested in. We check this at the, at the J where we can check it, where, where we have the motivic classes. So for the J which are between zero and K prime. And because this is somehow a dense set of primes for this Iwasawa algebra, it suffices to check this identity just for these K-theory elements, and then it holds in general, and then you can specialize this identity at the other J's where you're interested in, and you get finally this result. I hope this was a little bit clear. Sorry for being over time. Thank you. <laughs> I think, in a certain sense, uh, periodic interpolation in this talk means that that you have this these elements which are in QP vector spaces, and you find somehow a big Iwasawa module. So this is the module for the standard Iwasawa algebra, um, which can be mapped to all of these elements. So if you look at this in concrete terms, where you really have, for example, periodic Eisenstein series, then what you do is, I mean, you have, for example, periodic Eisenstein series. This is given by a certain Q expansion. You miss just some of the Fourier coefficients uh, for the n, which are uh, divisible by p. And, but the Fourier coefficients are there just numbers. And if you want to have a periodic interpolation of this, you take the Fourier coefficients elements in the Iwasawa algebra. So there are measures which you can specialize in themselves. Yeah, so the coefficients become, are in this very big ring, lambda um, in the Iwasawa algebra. And then you can specialize with the moment map this big periodic Eisenstein series. And you can ask, can I get back all these Eisenstein series on finite level, which where I started with, yeah? And the same thing happens somehow here with the cohomology classes, yeah? Um, this is this is a very subtle thing because it has really to do with integral and, and rational structures. You have to control denominators to do this, yeah? And, and the surprising fact is that you can do it in a very easy way. Um, of course, you could, you could think, okay, um, um, we are talking essentially here about one-dimensional vector spaces. So, so, of course, I can find some rational multiple of the K-theory class, which, which can be interpolated. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is not too difficult to see, but you want to know this rational multiple to make these kind of calculations to get relations to L values. And you have to know something about this rational multiple that, for example, it doesn't grow too fast in P, uh, divisibilities of P and things like this. Yeah. And this is this multitasking of this K theory elements I was talking about that, that they really satisfy this. Yeah. This is strange. With a big shift of coefficients, do you think it would be possible to like interpolate this thing to construct some geometric object which contains all the weights and then? Yeah, in a certain sense, this is how this theorem, uh, the interpolation theorem, is proven. I, I construct somehow um, an integral version of the logarithm sheaf and 
And in the, the ETAR relation, everything there is there. Or you want maybe to do this in the motivic world already, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, one would, would like to have that in the, in the motivic world as well. Um, uh, and I'm pretty sure that one can do something in this, in this, uh, 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 in this sense. But you should see, if I really take, um, I mean, already on K-theory and also on motivic cohomology, if I complete the coefficients to be Zp, I'm very close to etar cohomology already. It's not so clear if this gives much stronger results. The technical difficulties are unfortunately very <laughs> hard at the moment because um, uh, in the theorem of Annette and myself, which construct these classes, we use, for example, um, the computation of, of uh, Annette with co-workers um, of the, the motive of the commutative group scheme, uh, really as an exterior power, as, as one knows this from topology. Yeah, and, and these kind of results are only known for Q, Q coefficients at the moment. So it's not, I think Annette would have a distinct <laughs> a clear opinion if this can work in the integral setting. It cannot, I think. <laughs> but still, there could be some... <laughs> You're scared. Uh, GM squared. Yeah, yeah. But of course, there could be some device which avoids this, this decomposition. Yeah. Um, can you find Sure. No problem. Yeah, no problem. You can every, do everything for GM. This is not written, unfortunately. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but this, this is, it's possible. Yeah. If, if you want, this is already in Baines and Levin's paper on the elliptic polylogarithm, <laughs> but you have to look very closely. Um, they, they do something in this, and this, this works in this, this machinery. Yeah, yeah. No problem. So, any questions? Thank you.